Greetings and welcome to this Komodo cybersecurity webinar, Hacking Democracy, a Strategic Correlation of Elections and Malware. I'm Bill Weinberg, Director of Communications at Komodo, and we'll be joined shortly by Dr. Kenneth Greer, Chief Research Scientist at Komodo. Before we get started, there's a couple of logistics items. Everyone always asks, where can I get a copy of these slides? Well, you'll be able to experience this webinar as an on-demand webinar uh, by either going through the Komodo uh, Bright Talk channel or by looking at the email that you'll receive having registered for this event as part of the Bright Talk audience. So, without much further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Kenneth Gears and have him tell us a bit about himself. Kenneth? Hello, my name is Kenneth Gears, uh, and today I want to talk about a very hot topic, right, which is the evolution of computer network operations, uh, cyber attacks into soft space and soft targets. Um, I think there's three basic kinds of cyber attack. You know, there's, there's information gathering, there is there is information denial, and there is information manipulation. And they kind of come in that order. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is, is a lot of evidence for computer network operations around elections. So this slide presents a little bit of my, my background. I'm government background, so I'm on the intelligence side. I think about the who and the why of hacking. Um, you know, more than I do the how. And so if you have questions about particular malware families, countries, uh, or types that you want more detail, we have, we have many, many more details at the technical level. And you can send me a question or um, just get in touch uh, about uh, cases or, or a particular uh, technical issues. So there's my, my, uh, uh, my email address at Komodo, and you also have, you can, you can DM me on Twitter. Uh, but I write about this high-level stuff, uh, the use of hacking for political military intelligence uh, activities. So that's, that's enough on my background. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about now the, the, um, the evidence that we have, which, which is everywhere I look, basically. Uh, for a, a correlation between network security and national security. So here, um, I want to show you the, the method that I often use, um, which is surprising to some people, but it's very effective. And I will take a, a, all of the malware detections to begin with for a particular country, drop it on a timeline. Now, I can do this for cities or verticals, uh, malware families, different things. But for intelligence, you know, I, I can say, okay, all of our detections in China or the USA or Russia, just drop them on a timeline. And then I look for spikes and, you know, I can change the view on here to just see individual families or, or variants of malware, particular Trojans, etc. In this case, it's just everything. So there's a nice circle, as you can see, right around the end of uh, January 2017, and that's Donald Trump's election or inauguration. And, and at this point, you might not believe that there's such a correlation possible, but I'm going to show you that, that it's, uh, in fact, the case. And I want to explain to you quickly the, the way it works. So, you know, in Russia or the United States or, or China, there are nation states, contractors, hacktivists, researchers, uh, companies, and they, they use computer network operations of some sort, above all, to gather information, right? It's cyber espionage is sort of de rigueur for uh, governments today. I think that Vatican City has a uh, hacker team in the basement, right, uh, doing running operations. What you see, though, in a particular country, let's say Slovenia or Armenia, there are, in the graphs that I'm going to show you, there are potentially dozens of players, right, who jump in uh, when there's uh, fresh meat, right? 
in order to try and collect. So, so that's the, the long story short on this slide. Let me show you a couple more that will take it to a more uh, practical uh, sense as proof. So, so this is Armenia. They had a, a peaceful revolution this year, on April 25th. You can see this from the New York Times. Now, it's not a should not be a surprise to anyone that that would be our highest uh, detection rate for the day, right? In terms of, of malware. So you have you, cyberspace is just a reflection of real world affairs, right? So everything you do, whether you want to, to get a date or you doing online shopping, go to a movie, writing a research paper. Well, the same thing is true for soldiers and spies, right? What they do, they do online now. So these are not Google searches and these are not, you know, Wikipedia uh, reviews. This is malware detection, right? So this is someone leveraging malware for a particular uh, purpose, right? So, so here's that you can see a tight correlation here between a political revolution and malware. So, so here's another in a different part of the world in Burundi, right? They have a referendum this year, and again, it's the highest volume of malware detection by far, dwarfing every everything else, right? And it shows you that political things. And yesterday, I gave a talk at a different conference on military affairs, and so today, I think that's almost all exclusively military political slides. But yesterday, it was a lot military. It's really the same thing. When you have military tension, internal unrest, today we'll focus on politics, there will also be, these things are magnets for malware, right? And so you as an enterprise security um, expert, just be aware that in your space, uh, business occurrences, um, you know, political events, etc., all of these things are going to draw malware within to your space, right? The closer you are to the White House or the Kremlin, for example, uh, it puts you sort of in, in sort of a line of fire for some type of collateral damage, uh, even if you're not directly the, uh, the target. So he, here's a case too. Anything major uh, in terms of politics will draw, right? So here's just two slides on the, the summits this year between the United States and, and uh, North Korea, right? So you can see the buildup of interest on the part of uh, hackers, in this case, these are malware detections in Singapore just prior to the summit. Here's Finland, right? So when the, the summit is announced, you know, this is a more particular isolated viruses in this case. And again, you, you may say, well, that's, that could be anything, but in fact, it's in the very neighborhood where the summit was to take place uh, was the virus propagation, right? So. The internet, there's only one, and cyberspace, there's only one, but all governments are sort of struggling to, to keep their sovereignty, their law enforcement jurisdiction within that space, and it's tough, right? So there's a lot of foreign intelligence taking place, information gathering, um, that's basically how you know spies and soldiers are going to go about collecting information that they can turn into intelligence reports and pass on to, to commanders and um, chain of command. So in this case, this might surprise you, but I'm absolutely convinced of it. So the, the biggest, these are all worms, trojans, virus detections for the United States for a six month period. And the, uh, the tallest spike is, uh, is March 13th. And what happened on that date was that Donald Trump tweeted the, new, the name of the new Secretary of State and CIA director. And we know that this was um, a major uh, news event for the world because you know, there was an in-depth study saying that even uh, Secretary of State Tillerson you know, would follow tweets as you know, if they were you know, coming down from you know, Mount Sinai in a tablet, right? because this is how Donald Trump communicates with the world. So that's fresh meat that hackers then pounce on. And this is not one or two APTs, one or two countries, this is dozens, right? And that's why we see uh, the massive spike. So.
So some of it's foreign intelligence, and then some of it on the, the defensive side. Perhaps I could have used a, a, a different slide for this one. We have China, in which June the 4th, or the, the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, stands out just like this spike as the, uh, the top uh, malware detection day in China for the year. Uh, some of it, again, is, is cyber espionage, but a lot of it, I, I believe, is also law enforcement counterintelligence. It's, it's proactive efforts by the, you know, the Chinese government to defend its information space. So in this case, you have Belarus, which uh, adopts a law against fake news. And as you can imagine, that's going to draw out the hacktivists and the, uh, the, the lone hackers, the, the foreign intel services, but also defensive measures right, on the part of the government. And so this, this is how politics you can see it on the network if, if you just uh, have a look. So I think just one or two more slides here. Cyber war is a thing, right? The, the, the pressure or coercive power on the part of governments. These are detections in Iran. And you can see over the last six months, you know, Pompeo threatens to crush Iran, you know, massive spike. Uh, and then the large cluster of Trojans came during a period of high tension with the United States. I'm not saying this is the United States hacking. Uh, I've got dozens of examples like this. Um, not sure who it is, but it does come at a high level of tension, right? And you can see it on the networks in terms of malware propagation uh, and, and detection. Similar case here between Russia and Croatia. Uh, Russia very angry with Croatia on March 28th because they threw out a Russian spy. And, you know, if you're just looking at the numbers, you can see the uh, relationship between real world and cyber, specifically in our case, malware, right, that can be used, you know, to, to gather information but also to punish, right? So I, I went to Estonia in 2007. Uh, for the Pentagon uh, during its crisis with Russia. And, and that's largely believed to be an example of hostile packets that were uh, intended to, to punish, right, another country, sort of uh, international pressure or coercive power, right, via packet. Okay, enough on the background. We're here to talk about uh, democracy and defending democracy and, uh, and elections. Uh, from from hackers, and it turns out that's going to be hard, very hard. And the reason is is because the foreign actor that is going to insert, you know, uh, hostile information into a target space, they are going to leverage existing cleavages, right, in local uh, politics and culture, linguistic divisions. Um, and other uh, divisions, right, within society. These are age-old psychological operations uh, that, that they go back, literally, they call espionage, you know, the, the, uh, the, sec the world's second oldest profession. So I'm reading a book now by Christopher Andrew, uh, Professor Emeritus at Cambridge, uh, called The Secret World, right? And the book opens, it's a massive volume. And the book opens by saying God is, in fact, the first person to order an intelligence operation when sent the spies right from Sinai into uh, into southern Israel to, to gather intelligence, you know, and gave specific indications. How tall are they? You know, how short are they? How many weapons do they have, et cetera? How, can you bring some grapes back for us to taste? So... Espionage goes back forever, and I also think that influence operations, psychological operations, right, and democracy sort of is sitting on this precarious perch, right, when your rival or adversary uh, or even friend, you know, we had, for example, uh, Obama went to London to campaign against Brexit, right, and in, depending on your political persuasion, you think either that's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, you know, but that was a case, you know, and there's scads of other that we could think of on the top of our heads of influencing foreign uh, positions. It comes naturally to us. We all have opinions on how things should happen. 
So here's uh, malware detections in Iraq, right? So me as an analyst at Komodo, I'm very lucky in that we have we have uh, um, a lot of data uh, from most countries, and in fact, we have some data from every country on the planet. It's astonishing. I, I can color in, you know, the, the entire world map every week. So these detections in Iraq nicely correlate uh, not only to the first vote, but to the recount, right? And so these are beautiful uh, in that uh, these are the most important events. I think the other event I saw in Iraq of interest this year to hackers was a conference in which they were trying to determine how to spend a billion dollars, an international conference, or a hundred billion, excuse me, on how to rebuild the country. So anything with money, or military or political uh, value, right? These are things that 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 um, get intelligence professionals up in the morning, right? And that that, that can apply to a government agency, or it can also be a, you know a contractor, right? Working, uh, in this case, maybe a professional cyber criminal outfit, uh, you know, that's working under some level of state uh, protection. So you can see here that looks good. I looked back a little bit in our data, and, and I don't have a lot of granular uh, data on stuff that happened, uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, but in this case, you know, I dropped all of Norway's detections on a timeline, and guess what? You know, the, the, the top spike came within a couple of days of the Norwegian national election. And it's a fairly peaceful country, uh, but it's strategically located, right? much more so than you would think. Norway actually hosts much of the reserve equipment for NATO that would be uh, a part of a counterattack against a Russian invasion of Europe. Uh, and so not only that, but you think of submarines and special forces, and some of you with a military background know a little bit more about uh, this than, than average, but, but Norway plays a very strategic role, right? A little bit like Iceland, but with a lot more teeth, right, in the north. So uh, there would be a lot of people interested in this election. But all I want to establish today is a couple of things. One, a, a tight uh, correlation between malware and elections. Uh, and then something I'll show with you in a few minutes, very excited about what my uh, PhD advisor a long time ago would call a result, right? A, a, nice, uh, a nice takeaway for this presentation uh, based on uh, a malware detection uh, timeline. So here's uh, the gubernatorial election in Virginia last November. I mean, look at this. It looks like a nuclear bomb went off uh, in Virginia. And it turns out almost all of it was, was cryptic, uh, Trojans. But uh, basically the week prior to the election, this is you know, how I isolated the, uh, the data. But if I drop it on a timeline, it's a massive spike in the country. And so that's you know, how I was able to find it. Uh, in this case, I said, wow, what, what's happening in Virginia? Well, it turned out they were having an election, right? Uh, and the more recent one in Ohio, this was big in the news a couple of months ago, and I can't even remember what happened there. But again, uh, I want to show you, this is kind of a cool chart because I can say, well, these are Trojans detected in the United States. And then I say, okay, I just want to break them out by state. Right, so each state gives me a different color, right? So all of these, I don't know what the pink and the green is, I can't remember. But the massive purple, right, there is, is Ohio. All of those Trojans detected in Ohio. And it's, again, the week of uh, the special election that drew so much attention. Now, what is this um, is a very good question. Um, I can see where it is. In this case, it, it's in Dayton, Ohio, um, most of it. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, I did some searching on, you know, is there election infrastructure there? Is it, but you, you know as well as I do that the nature of hacking is, uh, that's only a partial answer, right? That could be a, a hot point, right, into, uh, you know, Ohio infrastructure. You know, it could be, uh, could be simply a clue, Right. Uh, but uh, the fact is, is when you see these spikes, you know, the more you put them together sort of in logical orders, you're going from data bits 
to information. And then once, you know, organized data bits uh, um, look like they're of business, political, you know, military intelligence uh, value, then that you can you, you uh, can take to your boss, right? Say so this this is uh, something that is of intelligence value, right? It's information that is is a difference maker, right? For a decision maker, right? So what I did then, you know, as I started preparing this uh, presentation, I thought, well, let me see all of the elections over the past um, over the past six to eighteen months. I've got, I, I, I amassed 18 months worth of malware detections. And most of what I'll show you today just goes back six months because that's as much as I've been able to dig into. If you want data for an election last year, please just send me an email. And I'm over the next, you know, before the US election in a few weeks, I'm gonna try and look at all of them over the past 18 months, as well as all the states that are currently preparing for, for this year's election. So I took 45 countries over the past six months, and what I found was 31% uh, of them. So I think I, I, the, the nations mentioned here out of 45, they experienced their highest malware detection rate the week of the election, right? So they, these are they, right? They either had an election, a referendum, a snap election call in the case of Turkey, or a vote recount in the case of Iraq. So, so the week of their electoral event, that was the highest. Uh, that was the highest malware detection uh, number. And if it wasn't, then I removed it from the chart. So two thirds were removed from the chart. But that's a fairly high high threshold because it's just so blunt, right? So, so um, the. Uh, it's a fairly high bar. The ones I'm going to show you, uh, starting with Molly here, uh, these are tighter. So I've essentially said, okay, you know, for each of those spikes, I said, what is in the spike, right? And we're only going to go in this talk uh, to the level of uh, malware type, right? But this is what I want to show you. I'm pretty excited about this as a uh, as a takeaway for you. Uh, in this uh, for this presentation, so in six countries here, and then I'll show you a, li a little bit more beyond that. The the nice cluster of malware around the election, but also a sort of a an order of operations uh, in terms of malware type, right? In sort of a, in a theory I'm putting together. I mean, we know that there's a relationship, for example, between worms and trojans or backdoors. So you have to propagate malware into a space successfully, right? And then, you know, depending on whether it's a virus or a worm, you know, virus would require some level of human intervention. You know, if I send you a, an email attachment, I need you to open it on your side. I need you to click on a link or I need you to respond to some clever phishing email, right? Um, a worm doesn't need that in that a worm is taking advantage of network vulnerabilities or shortcomings, right? And so, um, but in either case, you know, there is a propagation, but then there is an exploitation, a leveraging of a compromise. And so what I want to show you here is application followed by Trojan. So here in Mali, you can see the first and second round of, of the election, right, this year. Um, the, a winner didn't emerge, and so they have to, to do a runoff. Uh, but the malware is, is brackets the election pretty well, right? And here you see um, applications, unwanted applications, um, and followed by uh, Trojan activity. And that's the dynamic that I want to suggest. One, the relationship of malware to the election, right? The cluster around the election. Uh, but the propagation and then the leveraging. In this case, it's applications, unwanted applications, and even unsafe applications, uh, then followed by Trojan activity. So it's, uh, it's again, it's the proximity and it's the dynamic. And, and the, 
the thing I'm interested in in particular in these cases is that applications are more dangerous than we think, right? So that's the takeaway. I'm going to show you a few more slides like this one. But what we call potentially unwanted applications, you know, you might be afraid, oh, my, my, my employees, they are uh, playing games or they're downloading unauthorized software, but it's, it's benign uh, as far as a, a security threat, right, to our enterprise or our country. What I want to suggest is that, that um, it's more sinister than that. Uh, when, uh, when free software, free toolbars, adware, um, even things, net tools and things that you're downloading and using, they're reporting back to a huge question mark, right? And that question mark can be foreign hackers, it can be hostile governments, whether it's your own or another, but they're taking it, it's not just Sprite and Coca-Cola, right, that are taking advantage of you, but it is uh, hostile actors, right, including, uh, including hackers in this case, right? So let's move on to a, a, another a case study in Russia. So drop the time, timeline of malware detections, and again, you see applications, then worms, and then Trojan spike, right? And it's one, it's around the election, right? So this is a March 18th election, major event in world politics. Obviously, Russia uh, is a key player sitting between East and West, um, involved in multiple wars and, and uh, um, in current crises with uh, the UK, with Holland. Uh, and just today, the United States issued indictments against Russian hackers, right? Well, we're just looking at the election in, in Russia and elsewhere. But so the, the two takeaways, again, from this slide are, one, a nice malware map right around the election. And two, the order of operations, essentially. You have applications, worms, Trojans. And so, so here... I would suggest that you have applications that are being used to gather targeted reconnaissance, right? Intelligence against folks. And worm activity is the propagation stage, right? In the, the overall dynamic. And Trojans uh, are then exploiting the, the, uh, the malware that has, that has been sent out, right? So, and here's another thing. In the countries, I think, um, and I've been looking at these malware timelines for about two years now, the, a lot of the basic work, uh, let's say in this case, worms, I will see very common worms, brawn talk, in this case, conficker in Russia. These are things they're used to, right? But things that somehow still obviously work. Right, and they might be tweaked or something, but cases like Ramnit and Saliti, uh, Braun talk, you see them over and over again. But I also see them in conjunction with geopolitical events. So what I think is that sometimes hacker groups uh, or nations, you know, they're using common uh, hacker tools. Uh, in order to invade a particular space. And depending on the, um, the nature of the crisis, the urgency of the event, like if your country wanted to invade another country a month from now, that would look different than if, you know, a revolution took place today, right, and, you, and your troops had to respond. You know, there'd be two different levels of urgency, and so different kinds of, of malware would be used. But worms... Uh, they are an indication of, of, of urgency uh, and of speed, right? You need stuff done uh, quickly, and, and, uh, and worms are the best way to do it. Compromise many machines at once, right? You don't require user interaction. Here's another case. In Turkey, uh, on April 18th, the uh, president announced a, uh, an early election, basically over a year in advance, right? On April 19th, by, you can see that the spike is incredible. 
spike, right, in terms of uh, worm propagation comes just a day after. Um, you know, that the, the again, the, the, uh, the likelihood that that's a random event is very low, right? So you can see here, not only that, but there's other aspects to this timeline which are really compelling, right? So you, just to the left of the SNAP election call, you see, again, applications, unwanted applications, uh, and our gen generic application category. Then followed by worms, and then on election day itself, a, a nice collection of Trojan detections. Even before that, there's back doors, and I don't know whether that's uh, you know related or not. And again, some of these are going to be slightly out of order, uh, depending on you know the nature of the case. Every country is unique in terms of politics and technology, um, and so so there will be unique aspects. But I still think our basic dynamic applies on this slide, right? You see applications, worms, and trojans around an election event. And so in the United States, if you're listening from the United States and you're thinking about, you know, how to protect the United States election, uh, we do have to look at applications and potentially unwanted applications as an indicator, as a precursor to some kind of more serious activity. Right. So don't think just because it's it's, uh, um, you know, it's not a, um, you know, a, a, a high level Trojan or backdoor at the get go. You know, we all know there is a kind of a kill chain process, right, that uh, that hackers will have to follow. It's not like you can, you know, be reading the secretary of defense's email, you know, today, if you've been given that as a as a as a task. Right, you're going to have to build up to that, right, uh, slowly but surely. Uh, so, but this, in this case, look at this. This is a dramatic correlation, right, between the worm activity and the SNAP election call, and the colors match up beautifully to the two election events. So, here is a country in which we have far fewer um, installations uh, because it's you know it's again it's uh, it's a poor country in in Africa with with less connectivity but they also had a first and second round of an election uh, this year um, and it's a nice uh, it's a nice picture right of correlation here between you know the election itself and malware so you have first and second round and you have application and worm activity nicely bracketed right by the the dashed lines followed you know a few days later by you see uh, trojan uh, color but again so it's a very similar dynamic one it's around the election a nice cluster but two you see ele uh, applications followed by worms followed by trojans um you know and it's recon it's propagation and it's leveraging of malware for some you know political purpose and 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 again you you might very much be wondering on attribution but but I, I you know I don't know that that's so helpful in this case I mean that's a political question for political animals um, you know Komodo's a malware company uh, and what we're doing is is we're looking for compromises we're looking for hostile traffic uh, and malicious code Right, and so that's what we're pointing out to you: is this uh, correlation uh, between malware and any event of, you know, political, military uh, intelligence interest. And it turns out, it's in every case. If you, I promise you, if it's an important event and you have the right data, you will find the hackers. So here's an example in in Azerbaijan, a little bit different in that we see, you know, virus activity. You know, uh, instead, you know, and you coming after the election event and the Trojan activity coming before. Every country is going to be somehow unique, and I don't know what these hackers were doing uh, precisely. But, but basically, again, in Azerbaijan, you'll see that the basic dynamics are here, right? You have applications and Trojans and viruses nicely clustered around an election. You know, in this case, um, I'll, I'll take a second here just to explain that, that I, I don't know if we can do a lot of discussion about the particular applications, because in certain cases, they're going to be well-known software that is commercial in nature, right? And because every country is different, 
you know, me as an analyst, I want to point out to you uh, that applications, even if they have this potentially unwanted, in quotation marks, you know, before the app, um, they might be doing more than you think they're doing, and they might be providing uh, valuable intelligence to hackers who then subsequently can do more damage, right? So in this case, in Azerbaijan, I just want to show you that the green in particular, right? Nice little cluster of green right around the election, right? Almost uh, just nicely enveloping uh, the event. So here, uh, Colombia, right? Again, this is a little bit more spread out and on the right side of the uh, of the election, it's packed malware. So the usually, almost always, it's the the um, uh, MUPX, right, uh, or the uh, ultimate packer for executables, right. But this is used in a in a in kind of like a, a Trojan or a backdoor, in the sense you can obfuscate, you know, communications or exfiltration. Of data, and and here you see it's it's um, paired with backdoor detections too, right? So backdoor is a little bit like a Trojan, right? It's it's a, it's a secret way into a computer that is subsequent to the you know the malware propagation. But here, very logically, you have that on on the right side. What the hackers are doing, I'm not sure, and it comes a bit after the election. But before that you can see our very familiar unsafe applications, right, before the first round of election, as if someone knew the election were coming uh, and felt the need to insert, you know, drop malware into the target space. So this, again, this dynamic is, is fairly, uh, should be familiar to us by now. And you can see just before the second round, email worm, you see that, Spike of green there. Uh, this is also um, anything worm-like should you know should open our eyes and uh, um, wake us up, right? Because that means someone is taking advantage of you know known or open or discovered vulnerabilities in the target space, right? Especially when you see it happen just before. A, a major event like the second round of an election. So I love this graph too, even though, you know, at first it looks like, you know, there is there is some space in there. The logic is there, right? You know, the the recon, the event, uh, you know, with the email worm there just before the second round, and then some kind of leveraging, you know, what they're doing, I don't know, but we can speculate. It's kind of fun to think, okay, now they're going out and they're saying, what happened? Who's doing what? You know, are people happy? Or are they not? Are they, um, you know, taking some action? Now, you have to put yourselves in the, the shoes of a intelligence chief or a king or queen or prime minister or president in this role, right? What would you do in your own network space uh, given, you know, a political crisis or a, uh, an election or a war Right. So, would you target your enemies? Uh, would you would you check in on your your um, your supposed allies? Right. So, these are the kinds of things. Right. Within a particular space, and that's I love this kind of analysis because again, I'm I've got plenty of friends who are at the bit level and say, well, don't talk to me about elections because I'm you know I'm looking for you know the latest exploit, and that's that's great. But what this is, these charts that I'm showing you, they are hundreds and thousands of such uh, malware detections within an entire country's space, right? So what we're trying to do is, is, is establish that, um, you know, for your enterprise, for example, if you have an acquisition, a business merger, um, you know, there is a new CEO, there's a new product, any of those events, you know, put your name in the news and anything that's in the news is going to be a magnet for malware, right? That's the way it works. You know, countries, uh, I gave a talk yesterday showing similar slides on, on a military um, correlation. 
And there's also business correlation, right? So in one case, there was a major question of who was going to build a dam between two countries and a large uh, malware detection. In another case, one country got put on a naughty list, on a blacklist for being a tax haven, right, for criminals. Massive Trojan detections, same day, right? So that's the kind of thing I just want to, to, to give you as a takeaway. In this case, today we're talking about democracy and elections. And so I think it will be a softer glove on the front end anyway, right? And, and as we've seen in these slides, it will be uh, application malware. And uh, malware may be a strong word. Often it's potentially unwanted applications. But you can see, though, how hackers, governments, um, you know, even corporations that don't necessarily have your best interests at heart are leveraging uh, unwanted applications for, for purposes that you would uh, not want, right, within either your personal space or your, your network space. So this is the last slide in my presentation. And what it is is, you know, four countries that didn't have a lot uh, of, of uh, strong correlation, but they have that basic dynamic, right? And so in the top two, Montenegro and Paraguay, we have applications, right, showing up, I don't know what it is, four, five weeks before the election, as if someone knows, you know, the election is coming and they need to be ready for it, right? In the military terms, they call this, Preparation of the battle space. You know, you don't want to invade. Uh, you know, as Sun Tzu says, you know, you, you want the victory to be over before you even start, right? So if there's an election on the calendar, you know, for the beginning of November in the United States, there are going to be hackers who are already seeding the space, right? They're busy, you know, and I've already showed you the, the charts for Virginia and uh, in Ohio. Right? So it's not like the United States is immune to any of this. In this case, we have Montenegro and, and, and Paraguay and election uh, malware, I'm sorry, application malware seen prior. And in the case of Zimbabwe and Maldives, it's not application, but it's worm detections, right? And so, uh, so again, you know, worms uh, used to seed a particular space uh, with malware. And then subsequently, in theory, perhaps not in every case, you know, we don't know how successful the operation was, but then you will see backdoors, Trojans, packed malware, that sort of thing on the other side, right? Uh, signifying successful compromise. And, uh, and that, so that's my presentation. I think that, that uh, I'd be happy to take questions whether you have them now or whether you have uh, questions for me uh, by email, if you have particular countries or elections uh, or issues that you'd like to talk about. So, so me as an analyst, I'm primarily you know, high level looking at uh, strategy or, or the intelligence side right, of, of, of malware. In other words, who's doing what, uh, to whom, for what purpose, right? So not at the bit level, but uh, many, many bytes. Uh, so that's my presentation, and I'm happy to take uh, to take any questions either now or later. So I'll yield to the the uh, to the floor, but also in this case to the moderator for for intervention at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you for an excellent presentation and some very valuable provided information. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one relates directly to your last topic, that of elections and comes back to North America. The question is, journalists are spending considerable time tracking social media and bots associated with fake news, especially for the 2018 midterms. So are you aware of journalists or media organizations that are looking more or less the same way at malware detection as a way of identifying or investigating manipulation related to the election, in particular to the congressional and Senate races? Well, no. So <laughs> I, I, um, I don't mean that in a, uh, um, I don't mean that in a dramatic way. Um, the way I look at malware is is a little bit similar to, or is a lot similar to, an intelligence analyst that is doing what's called traffic analysis. 
most of the people I think who are doing traffic analysis in our field are at the bit level or they are doing um, forensics at a tactical or technical level. So they, I, I, I think that that um, more, you know, analysts should be looking at, uh, let's say, large uh, big data or large volumes of data, assuming that you will see um, what's called APTs, or that's kind of a synonym for a nation state or a professional hacker outfit. Um, one of the things that I think is that, that, that any major event is going to draw um, malware and hackers. So you have to, you have to, to, um, you have to assume, like, for example, if I can say, let's say you work at the White House, you probably get a lot of uh, security briefings. Um, one of the things that's not so obvious is that if you have a connection to the White House, not only you, but family and friends, coffee shops you visit, <laughs> all those are now targets too, because people are going to try and get to you, right? And so uh, I drew a, a, a map recently of uh, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. On, of our malware detections, and I saw a nice little red ring around the White House. And the reason is, is because you need to get close to your target, either logically or physically. And so, you, you know, you have to step back as an analyst and, and assume hostile activity, but you also need a lot of data. And then you need to look at it primarily through an intelligence lens. And ironically, the funny thing is, like I've been out at DEF CON for almost 20 years now in Vegas. And some of the very, very smartest technical people, I think, in the business, they, they, they are, they are very skeptical of anything that is strategic. And I don't know why. I can't, I can't understand it, frankly. Um, but they're, I think it's because they're very smart and they're very technical. But they don't necessarily step back and think, ah, okay, um, you know. Uh, as a city or as an event or as an enterprise, uh, you know, I can assume a certain level of targeting and interest on the part of hackers. And it's, and it's um, you know, that's for, for whatever reason the case. Uh, and so long story short is that, especially with the US election, I can promise you that dozens of hacker groups will be interested. And that's why we see those big spikes. I can show you Trump tweets, uh, actually Trump travel, Tillerson travel, Pompeo travel. There's a cloud of malware that follows um, VIP travel, right? And so um, within your enterprise, if you're in an enterprise, there will also be a cloud of interest in uh, technical personnel and in C-suite folks, right? Because those are decision makers and the technical folks are, can provide the keys to the kingdom. And so this, this in a sense, uh, it's just called traffic analysis. Uh, and it, you don't even need a, you know, to know the difference between a bit and a byte, right? You can say, well, all I need is, is a, uh, to read the newspaper uh, and to see where, you know, the elections or the major business events are this week. Uh, and that's where I'll find malware. Kenneth, you've been talking about malware aggregated around political events and around individuals and around geographies, like that red ring around the White House. How does Komodo derive the data that you use in these analyses? Well, one of the cool things about Komodo is that it's uh, 20 years old, and we have uh, installs in every country. And so some of you may have seen, if you if you're, haven't seen them, just to ping me, we have, uh, you know, even in North Korean IP space, we have some good uh, analysis out uh, showing a strong correlation with geopolitical events. Um, and so... Uh, the company is quite international, um, and uh, and we provide a fair amount of software that you can uh, that you can use uh, for free. 
right? And so for me as an analyst, that gives me a beautiful viewpoint. I think I've got over 2 million rows of data coming in every day. And if I, if I paint a world map according to malware type or family, uh, I can paint the whole globe at least every couple of weeks, right? So sometimes Eritrea is missing or Central African Republic. Um, and and for, for places like London or Warsaw or Moscow or New York, uh, it's quite, quite granular, uh, the data. And so it's a, it's a really cool aspect for me as, a, as an analyst, uh, the ability to see so m such varied data in so many places. And it allows me, for example, to compare um, malware discovered, let's say, in country X versus country Y. I'll give you an example. Last year, I did a couple of talks on ransomware. And one of the things we saw, ransomware moving, starting in Russia, and then moving into Iran, and then moving into Poland, and then over to the United States. And that was in the course of about six months. Um, and it went, again, it went Russia, Iran, Poland, United States. And when it hit the United States, that's when it became big news in the States. And everybody was so interested in it. In fact, it was for good reason. Uh, it was almost like the, uh, the former Soviet space, ransomware was being you know, invented and uh, then percolated through the internet over to, to um, you know, where hackers thought they could get a higher return on investment. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can see the birth and the death of, uh, with a whole lot of data, of malware families. And so one of the things I really want to do more work in is, is prediction. You know, so in that case, you know, you can argue you, you should be able then to see where it's going, right? You just have to build, build, build models uh, and to, to uh, you know, learn from the past and look to the future. But we've got the data. And, and uh, as, as I showed you in the presentation today, it was a phenomenal data set. You know, we can see not only election hacking in Norway, but in Mali and Sierra Leone and the United States and Russia and Turkey. And so... It's, uh, you know, the, then next comes the model building and trying to figure out where the bad guys are going next. So that data comes in from the over 87 million endpoints that Komodo is currently protecting. And you mentioned that there's a lot of rows of data every day. For the topic at hand, how do you winnow out politically related malware from the haystack of malware in general? Right. So I, I do think as, an, as a malware analyst, you have to try and burn the candle at, at both ends, right? So I often just drop the data into a tree map or a timeline, and I identify the spikes, and then I try and figure out why they occur. But I also can, for this particular study, I said, well, where have the elections happened in the world over the past six months, 18 months? And for those, those uh, detailed six uh, timelines I showed you, uh, in that case, I identified 13 national level elections over the last six months. And in 12 of them, there were easily identified malware patterns, right? So, so I went from the, the real world into, uh, you know, our malware detections. So you can go either direction. I think, you, indeed, you have to go both ways, right? Because there's all, going to be all kinds of malware spikes you didn't see coming. And, and I didn't know, for example, you know, that there was, you know, uh, like a couple of times I've seen massive spikes in Israel whenever there have been head of state meetings between the U.S. and Israel. And I couldn't have predicted that. I didn't know they were meeting, right? I, I read the news, but I, I didn't follow it, you know, can't follow everything. But I saw a big spike, and then I said, oh, Netanyahu's at the White House, or vice versa, right? And so that's an event, that's an example of a kind of event that would draw uh, um, computer network operations from numerous, you know, every corner of the globe, basically, because it's going to be on everyone's national security collection requirement list, right? So that's, in part, how we can see, you know, the summits and, and other things in, in the data, it's because it's not just one APT or two, but potentially dozens. Uh, so, and, and you can't necessarily say exactly who it is, you know, but as a cybersecurity company, 
um, you know, our, our job is to secure, I think, before it is to litigate or prosecute or retaliate or something, you know, basically. So, so the identification of the malware with the event is, is, is enough, I think, in most cases, right? You want to say, you know, this particular types of events and, or, or in practical case, that of X, Y, and Z, what's happening in the world, they have a lot of malware associated with them. And so you need to, 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 to be aware and to, you know, to, to redress the situation. Um, but yeah, so you got to go both directions. In this case, for this particular, for presentation, I said, okay, there are 13 elections in the last six months. 12 of them had clear malware clusters around the election event. So, Kenneth, this, uh, this information is really tantalizing, and we have a mix of folks on the webinar, certainly people from enterprise IT, smaller companies, and even regional and national governments. How can end users on their own or by coming to Komodo gather and access and assess similar data sets for their own purposes? Well, send me an email or you, know, you can you can apply for an account with uh, with us as well. We have a couple of things. Valkyrie is our is our is our system, right? It's really powerful because we have so many installs around the uh, around the world. Uh, we also have Comodemia, which is an academic side to the company. You can apply for an account and you can uh, interact with us about particular cases. You can send me an email. I post stuff all the time. Uh, but basically, Komodo has a, a terrific philosophy on unknown code, right? If you use our products, we contain unknown code until it has been uh, determined to be uh, free of uh, malicious uh, um, behavior, right? And so, so in the event you want to download and run uh, unknown code on your system, uh, it will be contained in a little green box that doesn't allow the unknown code to touch your operating system or touch your other data, right? So it will run in a container. Uh, and we have auto containment at at Komodo, which is which is a wonderful philosophy. If you didn't see this from last year, we got a great um, advertisement by none other than the CIA, uh, who called Komodo a pain in the ass, right? And so when you want to break uh, Komodo security, it is in fact wickedly difficult uh, because of our philosophy of treating all unknown code as as potentially, or in fact, hostile, right? And containing it, putting it in a uh, a visible green container. Uh, if you want to run this, it's not going to touch your system. In fact, Kenneth, you and I were at Black Hat together, where we introduced the Komodo Zero Day Challenge, where all comers, you know, uh, <laughs> hackers, uh, IT folks, even our competitors, can come to us and see if they can spoof our system, if they can beat our ability to detect malware. So if you're interested in trying that out, come to the Komodo website and look for the Komodo Zero Day Challenge, where we try to show that protection is a lot more than just detection. Well, we've reached the top of the hour, and I want to thank everyone for attending. And uh, Kenneth, thank you so much for your presentation and all the very interesting and valuable data presented. I also want to thank the audience and remind them that if you'd like to gain access to this presentation or share it with your colleagues and friends, you'll be able to access it through the Bright Talk platform as an on-demand webinar. So, Kenneth, any final words? So, you can expect malware around not only the U.S. election, we will definitely see it, and uh, as we know, 2016 election, we still quite haven't figured out what happened. Uh, but in your enterprise space, too, bear in mind that all of this analogizes uh, to your situation, right? So, so important people within your enterprise, important products, events, anything that's in the news, anything that's visible on the web, uh, you know, these are going to be magnets. Uh, for malware. And so you have to think logically about your space and uh, think about where the, the bad guys would go. Uh, and then you can design some of your defenses around that analysis, 
right? Sort of, and, and uh, be ready for them when they arrive. Very good, thank you. And again, let me remind you that Komodo is here to help you render malware harmless. Thank you, everyone. That's a wrap. Until the next webinar, this is Bill Weinberg signing off. Thank you.